Betty is going to come and bring us a reading from Ecclesiastes. Good morning, church. I'm reading um, Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 to 12. Two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm. But how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Even better, for a triple braided cord, three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. So, boys and girls, what do you think is the little message in that little film that we've just seen? What do you think it's saying? Yes, Amelia, hold on a minute, let me get to you. Working together and fighting our enemies. Working together. Is that what you're going to say, Jack? You've got something else to say? Uh, it was fun. It was fun. So, working together is fun as well, isn't it? Anything to add, Jaden? It's funny. It was funny. Absolutely. It was funny. It's really interesting. Sometimes we feel very alone. Very alone. But when we have a team around us, the love and support of other people, the encouragement of other people, then it, we can, it feels that we can conquer anything. If you think the penguins and the killer whale, or the orca, the little ants and the anteater, and then the crabs and the seagull, working together, we can overcome all sorts of problems. And I'd like to introduce you this morning to seven men. Thank you, Tunde. Here we have seven men. Stephanus, Fortunatus, Achaicus, Tychicus, Barnabas, Timothy, and Onesimus. Now, I wonder if those names ring any bells. For many of us, they will not mean anything at all. Timothy, we probably know, possibly Barnabas. So who are they, and why are they mentioned in Scripture, in the Bible? The truth is that these names, these men, are some of the unsung heroes of the early Christian church. Not because of any bold, courageous acts like wrestling lions, killing giants, parting seas, but because of their everyday acts of faith and kindness. And although their mention is brief in the Bible, it's powerful. And here is why. These men were intentionally sent by Paul as encouragers of the early church. Now, guys, you might think that the job, that being an encourager, doesn't sound very glamorous, it doesn't sound very important, but that is very wrong. An encourager is defined as one who gives support, confidence, and hope or one who gives support or advice so that another can continue to do something. So I'm going to listen to where these men are mentioned in the Bible. In Acts chapter 11, when the church at Jerusalem heard what had happened, they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw this evidence of God's blessing, he was filled with joy, and he encouraged the believers to stay true to the Lord. Then in 1 Corinthians, I'm very glad that Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus have come here. They have been a wonderful encouragement to me, as they have been to you. In Ephesians chapter 6, Tychicus, the beloved brother and faithful servant of the Lord, will tell you everything, so that you also may know about me and what I am doing. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, that you may know about us, and that he may encourage your hearts. And then in 1 Thessalonians, we sent Timothy to visit you. He is our brother and God's co-worker in proclaiming the good news of Christ. We sent him to strengthen you and to encourage you in your faith and to keep you from being shaken by the troubles you were going through. And finally, in Philemon, I appeal to you to show kindness to my child Onesimus. I became his father in the faith while here in prison. Onesimus hasn't been of much use to you in the past, 
but now he is very useful to both of us. Paul mentions these men because they were sent with reminders of the hope that we have. And we should all do the same for our family, friends, co-workers, and whoever the Lord places in our path. So guys at school, you need to encourage people. And here are four reasons why we should encourage others. Firstly, we need courage to stay true to the Lord. When Barnabas went to Antioch, he found some of the believers who had been spreading the good news about Jesus to the Gentiles, and they were turning to the Lord. But this outreach was not looked upon favorably by all. There were people outside, or people that didn't like the Gentiles being brought into the church. So just as today, when we share what we know about Jesus, it's not always received well by the world. But we need to remain faithful to the things that we've been taught and encourage others to do the same by reminding them all that God's done. As our roots grow deeper into him, he will give us the courage and the strength for our faith to grow strong in the truth. Secondly, there is power in standing together with fellow believers in speaking truth. It is true that one person can shine a light. That one person can make a difference in another's life. But there is strength in numbers. If fear creeps in or doubt begins to lessen your longing to encourage others, call in reinforcements. Ask for help. The Lord has given us to each other for a reason. Don't neglect meeting with other believers to lift up each other as friends or brothers and sisters in Christ. We're all here in t- for our times of adversity. Thirdly, sharing how other believers are growing encourages hearts. If you turn the news on, on the radio or the TV, on any given day, you will be faced with some harsh negative realities of this world. Our workplaces can be challenging. School or college can have its difficulties. And it is easy to become discouraged quickly. These stories question you about what might cause you to question what the Lord is doing. And it's one of the questions we are asked most frequently, isn't it? How can you believe in a God when there is so much suffering in the world? But the answers to those questions are that he is working and he's right here with us. His heart breaks for the same things that break ours. And so, with the knowledge of this truth, we need to make an extra effort to lift others up and share what he is doing in the little moments of our own lives and the lives of those that we love. Our stories won't make the headlines, but they're just as important and valuable and worthy of being told. And this world, those in our little worlds, need them to encourage their hearts. And finally, we need strong faith to keep from being shaken in times of trouble. Speaking Jesus' name, speaking God's name has power. The ability to share what he has done, what he is doing, and will continue to do, is a privilege that we've been given. The psalmist says, I believed in God, so I spoke. If we believe, we need to encourage others to strengthen their faith so that when hard times come, they'll be able to stay true, stand firm with refreshed spirits, and remember whose they are. The devil loves nothing more than a defeated soul because in that, he has the opportunity to sneak in fear and doubt and discouragement that can take root to anger and bitterness. So what a gift it is to encourage others, to remind them of their intrinsic worth, the gifts that they've been given and the purposes that they've been created for. And even more so, to remind them of a great big God who loves them, is right there with them and is worth telling the whole world about. 
So we're going to close this little section of the service with a prayer that we're all going to say together. So Tunde, could we have that up on the screen? I hope you can see it from the back. So let's say, Father God, thank you for all of the wonderful friends who have been an encouragement to me in my faith. Please give me the courage to encourage others in the same way, intentionally seeking and making the most of the opportunities I've been given. Help me to shine your light and stand firm in challenging circumstances as I point to you as the reason for the hope that I have. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. And the Harbour family are now going to come and bring us a reading from Paul's letter to the Thessal- Thessalonians. So our reading is from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 9 to 22. For God chose to save us through our Lord Jesus Christ, not to pour out his anger on us. Christ died for us so that whether we are dead or alive, when he returns, we can live with him forever. So encourage each other and build each other up, just as you are already doing. Dear brothers and sisters, one of those who are your leaders in the Lord's work. They work hard among us, among you, and give you spiritual guidance. Show them great respect and wholehearted love because of their work, and live peacefully with each other. Brothers and sisters, we urge you to warn those who are lazy, encourage those who are timid, take tender care of those who are weak, be patient with everyone. See that no one pays back evil for evil, but always try to do good to each other and to all people. Always be joyful. Never stop praying. Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Amen. Thank you. So guys, I'm going to be testing your memories in a minute. See if you can remember. So over the past few weeks, we have been thinking about the equipment that we need to be soldiers for God, to carry the light in a world where there is a lot of darkness. We have considered the belt. Can anyone remember what the belt is, what the belt represents? There's lots of people looking down like this at the moment. Grown-ups as well, anybody, what is the belt for? What does it represent? Belt of truth. Excellent. The next one, the breastplate. Well done, Stuart. The breastplate of righteousness. The next one, the shoes. Yes. Well done. Good girl, Amelia. The shoes of the gospel of peace. The next one, the shield. Shield of Gabriel. Shield of faith. Well done. The next one. The helmet. Anyone remember the helmet? Yes. Can you remember? No. Dad? Salvation. Salvation. And the last one. The sword. This is last week's one. Isabel, can you remember? Sorry? Sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Well done. So we've thought about all the things that a a soldier needs to defend himself or herself from the attacks of the world. Or to be offensive to go out there and fight the battle. But do soldiers go out on their own? Guys, what do you reckon? Do soldiers go out on their own? (laughs) What do you reckon? Olivia? Olivia? No, they go in together. They stand side by side. They protect and help each other. And what do they need to do for this to be 
the best that they can be. How, what do soldiers need to do with one another to be the best that they can be? Wesley. Okay. <laughs> if things start to go wrong, what do they need to do? Do you reckon? What do you do when things start going wrong? If you find something, Emilia. Um, you've, got, you've got someone who you trust. Yeah. What do you need to do with that person? And say. That, that's the word. You need to say. You need to, they communicate with one another. In Paul's time, when he wrote this letter to the Ephesians, armies would have had messengers. Men who could run fast and carry messages and orders to and from the front line to the commanders and, the re, to, and reinforcements. Communication was the key. If we're going to fight the spiritual battles of this world, we need to be in constant communication with our commanding officer. Paul tells us, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Pray in the spirit. God expects every Christian on earth to pray in this way. Do I? Do you? Do we see evidence of this sort of prayer in our church prayer meetings? We need to answer these questions because this verse makes clear that such prayer is linked both to our own spiritual growth and to our success in spiritual warfare. So what is praying in the spirit? Sometimes we have so much to say to God that we tell him everything that is on our mind without any sense of shame for what we have done wrong or any conscience reliance on the person and work of Jesus. We pour out our heart without kneeling at the cross. We talk and talk and talk without a tear on our cheek and without sight of God of the crucified advocate sitting at his right hand. This is not praying in the Spirit, because it is the Spirit's constant ministry to convict us of the things that we have done wrong, to remind us of the things we have done wrong, and to draw attention to our Saviour and to glorify him. Sometimes you spend time in prayer, but the great themes of the Lord's Prayer are mostly or entirely absent from what we have to say. This isn't praying in the Spirit. Because the word that he has inspired tells us what themes our Saviour expects us to cover. Yes, the whole word of God is of use in directing our prayers. By instruction and example, it shows us how to pray for a vast array of things, but the themes contained in the Lord's Prayer will obviously and always have special prominence. Sometimes we find ourselves simply saying our prayers, but our heart might not be in it. We are cold, we're listless, we have no fervor. Our faith might be a little wobbly. We might be low on energy. We know that there is no chance of praying with persistence. This is not praying in the spirit because his word constantly shows us that when people really pray, their whole soul is in what they're doing. Their emotions are engaged. They're holding on to the promises of God and they pray on and on and on until they receive what they are asking for. Sometimes when we come to pray, we simply do not know what we should be praying for. Nothing comes to mind. Despite our knowledge of what the scriptures teach us about prayer, we find ourselves completely at a loss. That is the time to be silent and to listen. 
read scripture and listen to what God has to say. So it is by reflecting on what praying in the Spirit is not that we come to discover what it is. It's approaching God as people who get it wrong and expecting him and expecting to be received by him on no other basis that the Son of God loved us and gave himself for us. It's praying in accordance with his holy word, giving prominence to the themes that are contained in the Lord's Prayer. It's praying from the heart with fervour and faith. And it's more than words. There is a consciousness of inner constraint. The desires of our heart are being moved in a particular direction. Something is happening deep down inside which is too wonderful to describe. In the name of God the Son, God the Holy Spirit is talking to to God the Father. And this intercession is somehow taking place inside of us. In the passage that we heard from his letter to the Thessalonians, Paul reminds us of the three marks of a genuine church. Firstly, it's a happy church. Always be joyful. There is an atmosphere of joy within a church. And I could sense that joy as people gathered this morning. They were happy to see each other. Conversations were taking place. And it's infectious. It needs to be where members and visitors feel that they are bathed in sunshine. As being a follower of Jesus is an exhilarating thing. Secondly, it's a praying church. Charles Spurgeon wrote, if a church is to be what it ought to be for the purposes of God, we must train it in the holy art of prayer. Prayer can be hard. It can be awkward. Do you find it difficult? Would you like a buddy to pray with so that you can encourage each other? Reading God's word and praying regularly. If you would, speak to Terry, Lee or myself. Join us at our monthly prayer meeting on the 17th of November. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we were to overfill the church lounge and have to move in to one of our larger rooms or maybe the hall for our church prayer meeting? And thirdly, a genuine church is a thankful church. There is always something to be thankful for. Even if things are dark, there are blessings to count. A wise man once said that if we face the sun, the shadows fall behind us. If we turn our backs to the sun, then the shadows will be in front. The door is not closed to any of us. We have a heavenly father who loves to give us good things and who will never play tricks on us. All he requires is that we should ask and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking. Knock and keep on knocking. In his time, we shall surely receive find and walk through the door. Prayer is God's gift to us. Individually, with a friend, or as a church, it's a gift, a precious gift. So to close, another quote from Spurgeon. True prayer is neither a mere mental exercise nor a vocal performance. It is far deeper than that. It is spiritual transaction between the creator of heaven and earth. Let's pray. Loving, amazing, faithful God. Lord, we forget sometimes how to pray. 
We come to you in a hurry with a list of requests. Help us, Lord, to remember that relationship that we have with you. You are creator. You are our creator. You love us so much. You are the parent who is disappointed when we make, get things wrong. Help us to always remember to say sorry. And to remember that with you we are forgiven. Help us to remember to forgive those who have upset us. Remind us to pray lovingly for them. And Lord, then we pray for our needs and we glorify you in our prayers. As we deepen our relationship and our understanding of you. So be with us, Lord, in this coming week. Always be there for us, we pray. When we get it wrong, by saying the things we should, shouldn't say, or maybe saying or forgetting to say the things that we should. Loving Father, be with us this coming week so that we can shine as light for you in our schools, in our workplaces, among the people that we come across day by day. Be with us, Lord. In Jesus' name.